The Pirates. Before we go in, you need to be warned about the peculiarities of that model of plasma rifle, Miles says, and Byron looks confused. You've installed a kill switch, haven't you? He asks. It has an IFF identifier, yes, but beyond that, it's a date tech. It's been remodeled for your species' massive grip size, but it's still Dake Tech. Miles explains, and Baron outright laughs. So not only can I not shoot any of you, but even if I got around it, the basic construction of the weapon means you'd have a nice loud warning that I'm trying something. Baron notes before shaking his head. I should have known pirates would be all over Dake Tech equipment. Weapons that are scarier than normal and still as effective as others? What's not to love? Beck asks with a smile. The slower initial fire rate. The weapon warming up and its signature growl cost precious seconds and therefore potential lives. They're also not as long-lasting as a Canid Solutions version or as easily repaired as a NRO industry standard. That's why I prefer Prov Manufacture. The guns are so very easily customized to anything you want. Agenda notes in a happy tone. Back on target, though, Miles begins. He then points up to a higher-up window where some scaffolding is being quietly set up. That's our entry point. The window was broken before these girls arrived and was never fixed since. We've sent up a small scouting drone. There are no sensors we can detect, and they tend to stay in a more distant part of the warehouse, meaning it's far away enough we can all sneak in and then get the drop on them. I want the first thing they sense of us to be Beeren's cannon powering up behind someone's head. I'll be doing my part. See you on the other side, Franklin says, and he simply fades away. Whatever he did was not telegraphed in the axiom and leaves Beeren pointing to where the red-coated man just flat-out vanished. He's making sure they don't just teleport and run, Miles says. Let's go. Is anyone else concerned that the man with admitted mental issues is that powerful an axiom adept? Biran asks. Apparently, he was as Biran had only gotten some smiles and rolls of the eyes when he looked for support. It certainly certified these people as mad in his point of view, shockingly generous offers or deviously clever actions aside. The window was far too small for Biran, but... A bit of spatial warping had him easily pass through it. Thankfully, it wasn't so much as to make too much noise. There was also some thing helping him. Something quieted the axiom beyond a few paces and seemed to be holding things still. He could only assume it was Franklin. That man was becoming more concerning the more Biron saw of him. Biron puts it aside as he grabs onto the rafters at the top of the building and begins prowling upside down. He's more than strong enough and large enough to treat the structure of the building like a play area. Lilpaw takes a perch near the top of an unused tower, long emptied of product and value. She either doesn't notice or doesn't care about the dust caking onto her as she gets into a position to easily jump in. The rest spread out and start taking positions. Baron spots his daughters. They're talking to each other around a table made of a large board over top some crates. Not far away is a large setup of several computers and a go bee woman typing furiously at it. Baron takes position directly above them and mentally prepares what he's going to say and how as he also makes a mental note of the nearest exit. If he grabs all three and goes clean through the computers, he can tackle through the boarded-up entranceway and easily, easily get outside with them. As he's limbering himself up to make his move, there's a flash of light and a happy laugh. Biron's blood freezes before boiling. His ears stop working as he beholds Kamari covered in blood and tied hand and foot. The Ledris holding him is laughing with all eight bodies. He drops down and lands on the back of one of the few alien races as large, if not larger, than his own. His Dake Tech plasma cannon starts heating up with the distinctive growling roar, an ominous glow that is matched only by the sheer fury on his face and his own low growl that actually shakes part of the building. Let my son go, 
Biran grits out in an absolute fury while he keeps the plasma cannon pressed against the joining section of the Lydris's main body. The one he's got his left claw wrapped around the waist of says something, but he can't hear it over his own fury. Three, he growls out as he grinds the massive barrel into her scales. She thrashes to try and shake him off, but then screams in pain as his foot claws sink into her to steady him and maim her simultaneously. Two, the countdown is clear and the threat is obvious. A laser is pressed into the side of his face, but there's a huge bang and the weapon shatters. Miles steps out of the shadows with a smoking revolver. More pointedly, Kamari has not been let go yet. One. His growl is almost inaudible as he pulls at the central extension and grinds the gun further into the scales of the Lydris and actually draws blood from the muzzle of the weapon digging in. Another entity warps in and the gobe tries to run with a teleport. She then is slammed back into the computers and for a moment, there is a flicker of Franklin hovering in midair with crackling energy covering him as he screams at her. Zero. Biran's countdown is over and Kamari still hasn't been let go. He fully depresses the firing mechanism and plasma erupts from the weapon and through the Lydris. All of her body scream and the boiled blood erupts from the body and coats both him and his son in gore. He ignores the dying slaver and pulls Kamari close before turning and pointing the weapon at the nearest. No, those are his daughters. He swivels the weapon away to the other nearest group of pirates. Put him down now. Baran can barely recognize the voice through his fury, and he turns to see... Not his problem. Beck has found someone holding a little red slobe and is apparently furious. I have a complete medical readout of you, Lopin. I know exactly where your major veins are and I will empty you in seconds if you do not put Kareem down right now. Beck threatens even as Byron calms down somewhat. Alira, Mina, Jen, you three idiots are coming home with me if I have to drag you out of this hell. These raging bitches know nothing or loyalty, dignity or compassion, and if I have to break your legs to keep you from running back to these suicidal fools, I will. Baran growls out to his wayward daughters. Woman, I will dissect you while you scream if you do not put my son down. Beck's threat almost gets Baran to stare, but he has his own children to look after. He can only hope his fellow father is doing as well. Dad? Kamari asks, and Biran holds him closer, even as he keeps his plasma cannon pointed directly at the nearest pirate. There's the sound of something happening, and Biran turns to see a brute arcana flipped upside down and slammed to the ground by the strange hook weapons of Lu. You're all right, Kamari. This is just a mess that will soon be taken care of. She's dead, Dad. Do not mourn her, my son. She would not mourn you. Biran says gently, but if not for me, she made this her issue when she dragged you in. You've done nothing wrong, Biran assures him. There is the sound of metal on metal and a scream of despair. Biran looks and sees a Nagasha hurling away a heavily compromised plasma gun and then backing away as Ryu threatens her with his sword. If you have more weapons you'd like me to cut through, by all means, draw them. Ryu threatens and the Nagasha simply raises her hands. Very well done. Very, very well done, Agenda says before she suddenly launches herself from her hidden position and then rises up to look over the crowds of would-be slavers. Come on out, dear men. These girls need to see just how outmatched they are. As you wish. Rings out from around the warehouse, including the empty air from Franklin. Biran can't help but feel like some massive joke just went clean over his head. Victor and Jake come out with large machined weapons that would look intimidating when vehicle mounted but carried by hand. It's almost absurd. Things go still for a moment. Then almost as one, the would-be slavers vanish, only to reappear as if hurled back with the image of Franklin flickering in near each of them. As you can see, None of you girls get to run. We found where you hide and we don't have any tolerance for your... 
bad behavior. Biran, take you children and get out of here. I release your daughters to your custody and no doubt the medics outside would like to see to your son to make sure he hasn't been hurt. One side shortstop. Jean-Luc says to the side as he and another man that Biran isn't as familiar with go at the computers. What do you think, Sai? I think I'll have this in a few moments, Sai replies as he quickly types away. Jean-Luc pulls out a plasma bomb and waves it in the gobe's face when she tries to approach. This leads to her quickly backing off leading to the Indian man laughing. It's like reverse catnip for the crazy. Hey, no one said you could leave, another voice calls out and a lopin woman is thrown bodily into the crowd again as another human walks out. You should have come out earlier, Marcus. Miles notes, If I did, she might have snuck off. Marcus replies as he starts adjusting his sleeves. Now, girls, there's no need to panic so much. After all, I'm here to save your idiot lives. My crew wants to just kill you all and be done with you. However, I see some potential. Perhaps you might be salvageable. We are, after all, moving to a more legitimate government. If you still have a killing edge, I do need boarding crews for attack craft, Agenda says, and there's an odd pause. She then turns to Biran. Why are you still here? Go! Nicely galvanized, Biran clips the cannon onto his belt behind his back and it locks into place before he grabs Kimari and rushes for his daughters. No wait, father! Don't! Jen begins. She's the largest of them as a lopin and still tiny and frail compared to him. He gets all three of them low and sweeps them up onto his shoulder before charging for the door. He pulls on Axiom and sets a barrier around them that he uses to batter down the boarded up entrance and outside the warehouse entirely. There is a forest of guns pointed at him and none of them fire. Head left. Medics are there. A voice says from inside his earpiece, and he follows it. When the hell could you do that? Alira demands, and he snorts. The little blood Sunir is outright pinned between her siblings. Always. If your coward mothers didn't hide behind hostages, I would have eaten them all. Biran rumbles out as he widens his gate and goes from a frantic dash into a distance-destroying lope. I'm sorry, Dad, Kamari mutters, and... Biran gives him a squeeze. You did nothing wrong, son. You never choose to be a hostage, Biran assures him. He then bounces his daughters. These three, on the other hand, need to learn about a little something called long-term thinking. They have nothing more to say to him until he gets to a tent set up to Canador scale and he carries his children inside. He places each of his children on a separate bed and waves a carib nurse away from himself so that she makes sure they're all right first. As she starts out, I'd fussing over Kimari, Biran turns to his daughters and gives them a glare. So, was following your mother's footsteps worth it? He asks them and Jen outright flinches. That was not a rhetorical question. Any answer they could have had is cut off when Beck walks in holding a tiny red slobe child. Doctor, when you have a moment, I need some varistic tamine. Kareem is going into a panic after being nearly caught again, Beck says in a business-like tone. Third container on the left, top shelf, she says as she doesn't look away from her check of Kamari. Thank you, Beck says as he walks over to get his son some medicine. Does it make you three feel good? Knowing that all you've helped build is just hatred, resentment and how all of it can just be taken away in an instant. And what do you have, huh? He has several lucrative job offers, a safe home in a good part of the city and has outright impressed the rulers of an entire planet. So maybe, Beck says, even as he pulls out a single tablet and breaks it in half. That's enough. I will parent my children, Baran says inwardly grateful for that bit of help. It coming from him is more easily ignored, but it coming from a stranger, from someone that they had only seen literally taking someone else apart, someone they had never seen weak, much more powerful. Sorry, Beck says as he feeds the singular tablet to Kareem, 